Okay, today is the uh, 26th of uh, July. Now we come to Majima Nikaya Sutta number 19. Dwe Da Vitaka Sutta. Two kinds of thought. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati in Jeta's Grove, Anatta Pindika Spa. There he addressed the monks thus, Monks, noble sir, they replied. The Blessed One said, Monks, before my enlightenment, while I was still only an unenlightened bodhisattva, it occurred to me, suppose that I divide my thoughts into two classes. Then I set on one side thoughts of sensual desire, thoughts of ill will, and thoughts of cruelty. And I sat on the other side, thoughts of renunciation, thoughts of non-ill will, and thoughts of non-cruelty. I stop here for a moment. This, uh, the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, the second factor is Sama Sankapa, right thoughts. Uh, and right thoughts consist of thoughts of renunciation or uh, no sensual desire. Uh, thoughts of non-ill will and thoughts of non-cruelty. So uh, wrong thoughts or uh, unskillful thoughts are uh, uh, the opposite. Uh, thoughts of sensual desire, thoughts of ill will and thoughts of cruelty. As I abided thus diligent, ardent and resolute, the thought of sensual desire arose in me. I understood thus, this thought of sensual desire has arisen in me. This leads to my own affliction, to others' affliction, and to the affliction of both. It obstructs wisdom, causes difficulties, and leads away from Nibbana. When I considered this leads to my own affliction, it subsided in me. When I considered this leads to others' affliction, it subsided in me. When I considered this leads to the affliction of both, it subsided in me. When I considered this obstructs wisdom, causes difficulties, and leads away from Nibbana. It subsided in me. Whenever a thought of sensual desire arose in me, I abandoned it, removed it, did away with it. As I abided thus diligent, ardent, and resolute, a thought of ill will arose in me. Similarly, when I considered this leads to my affliction, uh, the affliction of others, etc., uh, then it subsided. And similarly, a thought of cruelty arose in me. I understood thus, this thought of cruelty has arisen in me. This leads to my own affliction, to others' affliction, and to the affliction of both. It obstructs wisdom, causes difficulties, and leads away from Nibbana. When I considered thus, it subsided in me. Whenever a thought of cruelty arose in me, I abandoned it, removed it, did away with it. So, I'll stop here for a moment. So here, uh, the way the Buddha uh, did away with these uh, wrong thoughts uh, or unskillful thoughts uh, is to consider uh, that uh, you allow it to arise, uh, that it leads to your own affliction, your own um, suffering, uh, and also causes suffering to others and to both. uh, And also it obstructs wisdom and leads away from Nibbana. So when he realized that it was uh, wrong, uh, it was unskillful thoughts, uh, then it uh, subsided or he did away with it. Uh, Monks, whatever a monk frequently thinks and ponders upon, that will become the inclination of his mind. If he frequently thinks and ponders upon thoughts of sensual desire, he has abandoned the thought of renunciation to cultivate the thought of sensual desire. And then his mind inclines to thoughts of sensual desire. If he frequently thinks and ponders upon thoughts of ill will, similarly thoughts of cruelty, he has abandoned the thought of non-cruelty to cultivate the thought of cruelty. And then his mind inclines to thoughts of cruelty. I stop here for a moment. This paragraph, uh, this passage uh, is extremely important. What we frequently think uh, and ponder on, uh, that becomes the inclination of our mind, uh, our habit pattern. So we create habit patterns in our mind. Uh, nowadays, uh, scientists talk about what is uh, 
what you call it? No, neuron pathways and all this. Uh, so, uh, so long ago, 2,500 years ago, uh, the Buddha already saw this, uh, that uh, if we continue thinking in a particular way, uh, we form these habit patterns in our mind, and our mind uh, always inclines in that direction. So it's very important that, uh, uh, as the Buddha here says, uh, that if we are practicing the spiritual path, uh, we know that these are unskillful thoughts. Uh, we must immediately nip it in the bud. Of course, uh, for most uh, worldly people, uh, if thoughts of sensual desire arise, uh, they like to think more about it, uh, they dream and all this thing. Uh, so it just strengthens the uh, sensual desire uh, or ill will or cruelty. Uh. So this is a very important passage uh, that uh, what we frequently think and ponder upon, uh, that becomes the inclination or habit pattern of our mind. So that's why it's very important uh, to always constantly look into our mind. How are we thinking? Are we thinking skillful thoughts or unskillful thoughts? Uh, what kind of habit pattern are we creating in our mind? Uh, okay, to continue. Just as in the last month of the rainy season in the autumn, when the crops thicken, a cow herd would guard his cows by constantly tapping and poking them on this side and that, with a stick to check and curb them. Where is that? because he sees that he could be flogged, imprisoned, fined or blamed if he let them stray into the crops. So too I saw in unwholesome states danger, degradation and defilement, and in wholesome states the blessing of renunciation, the aspect of cleansing. As I abided thus, diligent, ardent and resolute, the thought of renunciation arose in me. I understood thus, this thought of renunciation has arisen in me, this does not lead to my own affliction or to others' affliction or to the affliction of both. It aids wisdom, does not cause difficulties and leads to Nibbana. If I think and ponder upon this thought even for a night, even for a day, even for a night and day, I see nothing to fear from it. But with excessive thinking and pondering, I might tire my body. And when the body is tired, the mind becomes disturbed. And when the mind is disturbed, it is far from concentration. So I steadied my mind internally, quieted it, brought it to singleness and concentrated it. Why is that? So that my mind should not be disturbed. As I abided thus diligent, ardent and resolute, a thought of non-ill will arose in me. Similarly, a thought of non-cruelty. I understood thus, this thought of non-ill will or non-cruelty has arisen in me. This does, this does not lead to my own affliction or to others' affliction or to the affliction of both. It aids wisdom, does not cause difficulties and leads to Nibbana. If I think and ponder upon this thought even for a night, even for a day, even for a night and day, I see nothing to fear from it. But with excessive thinking and pondering, I might tire my body. And when the body is tired, the mind becomes disturbed. And when the mind is disturbed, it is far from concentration. So I steadied my mind internally, quieted it, brought it to singleness, and concentrated it. Why is that? So that my mind should not be disturbed. Monks, whatever a monk frequently thinks and ponders upon, that will become the inclination of his mind. If he frequently thinks and ponders upon thoughts of renunciation, he has abandoned the thought of sensual desire to cultivate the thought of renunciation. And then his mind inclines to thoughts of renunciation. If he frequently thinks and ponders upon thoughts of non-ill will, uh, similarly thoughts of non-cruelty, he has abandoned the thought of uh, ill will and cruelty to cultivate the thought of non-ill will and non-cruelty. And then his mind inclines to thoughts of non-cruelty. I'll stop here for a moment. Uh, so this is in the converse. Uh, if we constantly think skillful thoughts, uh, that becomes our habit pattern, uh, and we frequently think in that direction. Uh, so it is a training of the mind uh, that we need to cultivate. Uh. Just as in the last month of the hot season, when all the crops have been brought inside the villages, the cow herd would guard his cows while staying at the root of a tree or out in the open, since he needs only to be mindful that the cows are there. So too, there was need for me only to be mindful that those states were there. 
tireless energy was aroused in me and unremitting mindfulness was established. My body was tranquil and untroubled. My mind concentrated and unified. And now we... Buddha refers to... Uh, let me see. Quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, I entered upon and abided in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought, with delight and pleasure born of seclusion. With the stilling of applied and sustained thought, I entered upon and abided in the second jhana, which has self-confidence and singleness of mind, without applied and sustained thought, with delight and pleasure born of concentration. With the fading away as well of delight, I abided in equanimity and mindful and fully aware, still feeling pleasure with the body. I entered upon and abided in the third jhana, on account of which noble once announced, he has a pleasant abiding, who has equanimity and is mindful. With the abandoning of pleasure and pain, and with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, I entered upon and abided in the fourth jhana, which has neither ple pain nor pleasure, and after purity of mindfulness and equanimity. When my concentrated mind was thus purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfection, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, I directed it to the, no to the knowledge of the recollection of past lives. I recollected my manifold past lives, that is, one birth, two births, three, four, five, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100, 1,000, 100,000 births, many aeons of world contraction, many aeons of world expansion, many aeons of world contraction and expansion. There I was so named of such a clan with such an appearance, such was my nutriment, such my experience of pleasure and pain. And passing away from there, I reappeared elsewhere. And there too I was so named of such a clan, etc., Passing away from there, I reappeared here. Thus, with the aspects and particulars, I recollected my manifold past lives. This was the first true knowledge attained by me in the first watch of the, of the night. Ignorance was banished and true knowledge arose. Darkness was banished and light arose, as happens in one who abides diligent, ardent, and resolute. When my concentrated mind was thus purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfection, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, I directed it to the knowledge of the passing away and reappearance of beings. With the divine eye which is purified and surpasses the human, I saw beings passing away and reappearing, inferior and superior, fair and ugly, uh, and I understood how beings pass on according to their actions. Mm. Thus with the divine eye which is purified and surpasses the human, I saw beings passing away and reappearing, inferior and superior, fair and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate, and I understood how beings pass on according to their actions. This was the second true knowledge attained by me in the second watch of the night. Ignorance was banished and true knowledge arose, darkness was banished and light arose, as happens in one who abides diligent, ardent and resolute. When my, when my concentrated mind was thus purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfection, malleable, wieldy, steady and attained to imperturbability, I directed it to the knowledge of the destruction of the Tains or Asavas. I direct, directly knew as it actually is, this is, this is suffering. I directly knew as it actually is, this is the origin of suffering. I directly knew as it actually is, this is cessation of suffering. I directly knew as it actually is, this is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. I directly knew as it actually is, these are taints. I directly knew as it actually is, this is the origin of taints. I directly knew as it actually is, this is the cessation of taints. I directly knew as it actually is, this is the way leading to the cessation of taints. When I knew and saw thus, my mind was liberated from the taint of sensual desire, from the taint of being, and from the taint of ignorance. When it was liberated, there came the knowledge, it is liberated. I directly knew, birth is destroyed, the holy life has been lived. What had to be done, has been done. There is no more coming to any state of being. This was the third true knowledge attained by me in the third watch of the night. Ignorance was banished and true knowledge arose. Darkness was banished and light arose. As, abide, as, as happens in one who abides diligent, ardent and resolute. So here is just a description of how the Buddha attained enlightenment on that night. To continue, suppose monks, 
that in a wooded range there was a great low-lying marsh near which a large herd of deer lived. Then a man appeared desiring their ruin, harm and bondage, and he closed off the safe and good path that led to their happiness, and he opened up a false path, and he put out a decoy and set up a dummy so that the large herd of deer might later come upon calamity, disaster and loss. But another man came desiring their good welfare and protection, and he reopened the safe and good path that led to their happiness, and he closed off the false path, and he removed the decoy and destroyed the dummy, so that the large herd of deer might later come to growth, increase and fulfillment. Monks, I have given this simile in order to convey a meaning. This is the meaning. The great low-lying marsh is a term for sensual pleasures. The large herd of deer is a term for beings. The man desiring their ruin, harm and bondage is a term for Mara, the evil one. The false path is a term for the wrong eightfold path, that is wrong view, wrong intention or wrong thoughts, eh? wrong speech, wrong action, wrong livelihood, wrong effort, wrong mindfulness and wrong concentration. The decoy is a term for delight and lust. The dummy is a term for ignorance. The man desiring the good welfare and protection is a term for the Tathagata, Arahan, Samasam Buddha. The safe and good path that led to the happiness is a term for the noble eightfold path. That is, right view, right thoughts, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness and right concentration. So monks, the safe and good path that leads to happiness has been reopened by me. The wrong path has been closed off. The dummy uh, destroyed, the decoy removed. What should be done for disciples out of compassion by a teacher who seeks their welfare and has compassion for them? That I have done for you, monks. The, there are these roots of trees, these empty huts. Meditate, monks. Do not delay or else you will regret it later. This is our instruction to you. That is what the Blessed One said. The monks were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. So this last part about the Mara trying to lead us the wrong path. Unfortunately, even nowadays, there are some monks, they teach the Dhamma, but unfortunately they teach the wrong Dhamma. So they are also like Mara, leading us the wrong way. Sometimes the easy way, sometimes the way that people... I like uh, because it's easier to practice. Uh, so we have to be extremely careful. Uh, uh, so to follow the right way, uh, uh, our teacher uh, is always the Buddha. And now that he has entered Nibbana, he says uh, uh, that uh, we should always refer to his suttas, uh, suttas like this. Uh, uh. Going back to the earlier part, uh, where a monk, what a monk frequently thinks and ponders upon, uh, that will become the inclination of his mind, uh, the habit pattern. Uh, uh, it uh, brings to my mind uh, uh, several years ago, one of our Buddhist devotees told me that his auntie uh, had a very nasty temperament, a very nasty temper and a very unpleasant character, always angry and had a lot of hatred, even for his own rel- her own relatives and all these things. Uh. So when she died at the old age, two days before she died, two long teeth came out, Dracula's teeth came out of her mouth. The children were shocked. And uh, this man who told me, he also saw it himself. So they tried to close the mouth, but they could not hide the teeth. But two days later, when she passed away, the two teeth disappeared. It just proves uh, that two days before she died, uh, she already turned into that type of ghost, uh, that fierce type of ghost uh, with the two teeth. Uh. Mm. So it's very simple. I mean, if, if you understand this sutta, you, you know why? Uh, because she has always been having that kind of character, uh, so much hatred and anger and all that. Uh, so she has made herself into that kind of uh, a being, uh, even with the human body. Mm. So that's why it's very important uh, that... Uh, we cultivate uh, skillful thoughts. Uh, uh, there are a lot of things in this world uh, that uh, people uh, don't understand. Uh, for example, like uh, indulging in sensual pleasures, indulging in uh, food and all that. Uh, we think uh, is harmless, uh, but actually uh, 
uh, in the suttas, uh, you find uh, that uh, people who indulge in all these things, uh, they go to woeful places of rebirth. Uh, why? Because it is based, uh, this type of uh, thoughts, this type of actions are based uh, by animals or, or uh, ghosts and all this. Uh, so we, we debase ourselves uh, by this type of actions. Uh, so... Uh, because we have certain tendencies, uh, just like the story, what the, the story of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Uh, uh, there are two parts of us, uh, the good part, the, the bad part, the animal part and the angelic part. Uh, so it's up to us which one we want to choose. If we uh, are careless, uh, we just allow ourselves uh, to follow our base tendencies, uh, then we make ourselves into this type of creature, just like this woman. Uh, so, when we are reborn to a woeful plane, uh, then only we, we know uh, why. So, uh, in the suttas, uh, the Buddha says, uh, when a being uh, goes into hell, uh, then he will realize uh, what actions he did uh, that make him fall into hell. At that time he realized uh, it was a big mistake. Uh, nobody taught him uh, that those actions will bring him to hell. Or even to the ghost realm. Uh, uh, Okay, the next sutta, number 20, Vitaka Santana Sutta, the removal of distracting thoughts. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati in Jeta's Grove, another up in Deeker's Park. There he addressed the monks thus, Monks, Rebel Sir, they replied, the Blessed One said this, Monks, when a monk is pursuing the higher mind, from time to time he should give attention to five signs. What are the five? Here, monks, when a monk is giving attention to some sign, and owing to that sign there arise in him evil and wholesome thoughts connected with desire, with hate, and with delusion, then he should give attention to some other sign connected with what is wholesome. When he gives attention to some other sign connected with what is wholesome, then any evil and wholesome thoughts connected with desire, with hate, and with delusion are abandoned in him and subside. With the abandoning of them, his mind becomes steadied internally, quieted, brought to singleness and concentrated. This as a skilled carpenter or his apprentice might knock out, remove and extract a coarse pack by means of a fine one. So too, when a monk gives attention to some other sign connected with what is wholesome, his mind becomes steadied internally, quieted, brought to singleness and concentrated. I'll stop here for a moment now. So here the Buddha says, uh, when uh, um, when evil and wholesome thoughts uh, connected with desire, hatred, and delusion arise, uh, then we should pay attention uh, to some other object uh, connected with what is wholesome. Uh, for example, if you uh, you have uh, sensual thoughts or, or sexual thoughts arise. Uh, then instead of paying attention to um, uh, a sexual uh, object uh, or sensual object, uh, then you pay attention to some other sign, uh, for example, asuba, loathsomeness of the body, uh, or impermanence, uh, impermanence uh, of everything in the world. Uh. Or if you have thoughts of anger, uh, hatred arise, uh, then uh, uh, you you you. Pay attention to the opposite, metta, loving kindness, loving kindness. And if you have thoughts connected with delusion arise, that is hard to see. But if you happen to notice it, then you can contemplate on the Dhamma. So that is all these are connected with what is wholesome. Okay, to continue if while he is giving attention to some other sign connected with what is wholesome, there still arise in him evil and wholesome thoughts connected with desire, with hatred and with delusion, then he should examine the danger in those thoughts thus. These thoughts are unwholesome, they are reprehensible, they result in suffering. When he examines the danger in these thoughts, then any evil and wholesome thoughts connected with desire, hatred and delusion are abandoned in him and subside. With the abandoning of them, 
His mind becomes steadied internally, quieted, brought to singleness and concentrated. This as a man or a woman, young, youthful and fond of ornaments, would be horrified, humiliated and disgusted if the carcass of a snake or a dog or a human being were hung around his or her neck. So too, when a monk examines the danger in those thoughts, his mind becomes steadied internally, quieted, brought to singleness and concentrated. Uh, I'll stop you for a moment. So here, the second way uh, of uh, removing uh, distracting thoughts, uh, unskillful thoughts, uh, is to think of the danger in those thoughts, uh, uh, how it can lead you uh, to unwholesome, <coughs> to uh, 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 woeful planes of rebirth. Uh, uh, so uh, when we realize uh, uh, the, the danger, uh, then uh, you quickly uh, remove them. Uh, okay, to continue. If while he is examining the danger in those thoughts, there still arise in him evil, unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, hatred and delusion, then he should try to forget those thoughts and should not give attention to them. When he tries to forget those thoughts and does not give attention to them, then any evil, unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, hatred and delusion are abandoned in him and subside. With the abandoning of them, his mind becomes steadied internally, quieted, brought to singleness and concentrated. Just as a man with good eyes who did not want to see forms that had come within range of sight, would either shut his eyes or look away. So too, when a monk tries to forget those thoughts and does not give attention to them, his mind becomes steadied internally, quieted, brought to singleness and concentrated. Uh, I stop here for a moment. So here... The third way uh, is not to pay attention. If you try the first way, it doesn't work. The second way, it doesn't work. Then you try the third way, uh, not to pay attention. These these probably are all connected with, uh, say, like when you are meditating. You are meditating and all these unwholesome states arise. Uh, here the Buddha is trying to tell you what to do. Uh. Okay, the fourth one. If while he is trying to forget those thoughts and is not giving attention to them, there still arise in him evil, unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, hatred and delusion. Then he should give attention to stilling the thought volition of those thoughts. When he gives attention to stilling the thought volition of those thoughts, then any evil, unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, hatred and delusion are abandoned in him and subside. With the abandoning of them, his mind becomes steady, internally quieted, brought to singleness and concentrated. Just as a man walking fast might consider, why am I walking fast? What if I walk slowly? And he would walk slowly. Then he might consider, why am I walking slowly? What if I stand? And he would stand. Then he might consider, why am I standing? What if I sit? And he would sit. Then he might consider, why am I sitting? What if I lie down? And he would lie down. By doing, by doing so, he would start substitute each grosser posture, one that was subtler. He would, he would substitute for each grosser posture, one that was subtler. So too, when a monk gives attention to stilling the thought volition of those thoughts, his mind becomes steady internally, quieted, brought to singleness and concentrated. Stop here for a moment now. This here uh, that I've translated as thought volition, uh, it is vitaka sankara. Vitaka is thought, uh, uh, and sankara is volition. Uh, generally, uh, many places uh, we come across this word, uh, sankara, uh, sankara, and um, the the meaning uh, that is appropriate uh, is actually volition, uh, just like uh, in the five khandas, one of the five aggregates. Uh, uh, body and mind uh, is sankara, and there it is translate. It is uh, 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 volition, uh, will. Uh. So in other places also, uh, the unfortunately, uh, uh, a lot of books uh, translate like here. They call it thought formation. This word formation. Uh, uh, recently, I think Rebbe Bhikkhu Bodhi's uh, translation, the Sangyutta Nikaya, he says volitional formation. Uh, so he goes back to volition again. But uh, previously, uh, he, they, they always translate as formation. And to me, this word formation uh, is one of those blur words. Uh, and they don't really understand uh, what it is actually. So they try to use a word uh, that encompasses many things. Uh, 
Uh, so they think this word formation uh, can encompass many things, uh, including volition. Uh. But here, uh, what do you mean by stealing the thought volition? When we have a thought, uh, there is a volition uh, to continue that thought. Uh. For example, if you have a thought of sensual desire and you, you get excited, uh, you want to continue thinking, thinking, uh, or, or if you're, you, you, you are very angry with somebody, uh, then you, you, you keep thinking and thinking. So when you start to examine uh, your, this uh, volition behind the thinking, uh, then it, it starts to slow down. Uh, why am I, uh, why am I continuing to, to think in this direction? Uh, that's why the simile given here, just as a man walking fast might consider, why am I walking fast? What if I walk slowly? Uh, so here, uh, we try to see uh, um, where the thought comes from. Uh, the thought comes uh, is because we have the intention uh, to continue thinking. Uh, so this uh, thought volition uh, or, or thought intention uh, is actually, uh, to, to me, uh, the, 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 in, the intention to think. Uh, uh, and if we start examining it, uh, then it will slow down. Uh, if we if we don't notice uh, where the thought comes from, uh, then we just continue thinking. Uh. Okay, to continue. If while he's still giving attention, if while he's giving attention to stealing the thought, uh, volition or intention of those thoughts, there still arise in him evil, unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, hatred, and delusion. Then with his teeth clenched and his tongue pressed against the roof of his mouth. He should beat down, constrain, and crush mind with mind. When with his teeth clenched and his tongue pressed against the roof of his mouth, he beats down, constrains, and crushes mind with mind, then any evil, unwholesome thoughts connected with desire, hatred, and delusion are abandoned in him and subside. With the abandoning of, of them, his mind becomes steadied internally, quieted, brought to singleness, and concentrated. Just as a strong man might seize a weaker man by the head or shoulders and beat him down, constrain him and crush him. So too, when with his teeth clenched and his tongue pressed against the roof of his mouth, a monk beats down, constrains and crushes mind with mind. His mind becomes steady internally, quieted, brought to singleness and concentrated. Uh, stop here for a moment. So this uh, last one uh, is using the strength of his mind to crush those unwholesome thoughts. La. But you're not you're going, to, going to be able to do that na, with a scattered mind. Na. So you can only do that na, if you your mind is strong enough, na, that you're able to focus it. Na, na. Monks, when a monk is giving attention to some sign, and owing to that sign there arise in him evil, unwholesome thoughts connected with de desire, hatred and delusion, then when he gives attention to some other sign connected with what is wholesome, any such evil, unwholesome thoughts are abandoned in him and subside. And with the abandoning of them, his mind becomes steady, internally quieted, brought to singleness and concentrated. When he examines the danger in those thoughts, when he tries to forget those thoughts and does not give attention to them, when he gives attention to stealing the thought, volition or intention of those thoughts, when with his teeth clenched and his tongue pressed against the roof of his mouth, he beats down, constrains and crushes mind with mind, any such evil, unwholesome thoughts are abandoned in him, and his mind becomes steady internally, quieted, brought to singleness and concentrated. This monk is then called a master of the causes of thought. He will think whatever thought he wishes to think, and he will not think any thought that he does not wish to think. He has severed craving, flung off the fetters, and with a complete penetration of conceit he has made an end of suffering. That is what the Blessed One said. The monks were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. Uh, that's the end of the sutta. So this sutta has given us uh, some uh, um, uh, this uh, way uh, of dealing uh, with unwholesome thoughts that arise, uh, especially during meditation. So the first one is uh, to give attention to some other sign uh, which is wholesome uh, instead of uh, giving attention to the sign uh, that is unwholesome. For example, the Buddha says, uh, when we notice uh, the beauty uh, uh, of, of, of some uh, being, uh, then uh, lustful thoughts arise. Uh, so, instead of uh, uh, observing uh, or noticing uh, the beauty, uh, we, we, we notice the opposite, uh, asuba, the 
uh, unattractiveness uh, of the body, for example, uh, or the impermanence, uh, how that uh, body uh, very soon uh, will grow old and ugly. Uh, or when hatred arises, uh, then we give attention to metal. Uh, then the second one uh, uh, is to uh, realize uh, the danger in those thoughts. Uh, when you uh, know the danger is in those thoughts, uh, then uh, you will uh, be able to get rid of it. Uh, but then also uh, you have to know the Dhamma quite well uh, to, to realize uh, the danger in them. The third way uh, is to try to forget the thoughts uh, and not pay attention to them. Uh. The fourth uh, is to uh, to observe uh, the thought volition or the thought intention uh, and slow down the thoughts. Uh. Uh, and the fifth uh, is to use the strength of mind uh, to just beat down uh, your mind uh, and quieten it. Quieten it uh.